All the commissioners are present. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, uh, if you've had a chance to review the agenda, uh, uh, you want to do a motion to approve that agenda? Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, uh, could we just allow a few minutes for our public health director and emergency management director to give us an update on the coronavirus activities? Okay. At some point, we'll, whenever then, you want to do it. And then we'll do public forum. Okay. All righty. Come on down. Renee Crowdings, I'm the Public Health Division Director for Stearns County. And good morning, Erin Tufty, the Emergency Manager. So we want to take about five to seven minutes of your time to just give you an update on what's happening around COVID-19. Um, so what we'll do is just start with a short update on the situation, um, talk a little bit about some of the public health strategies that we use around mitigation and why we use the strategies that we're using. And then Erin's going to give an update on kind of what we've been working on for the past um, three, four weeks. So so as you heard last Friday, Minnesota had its first case. We were anticipating that that was going to happen. Um, we have been having several conference calls with the Minnesota Department of Health, and on that Tuesday, they basically told us that they anticipate within the next week, week and a half, that we would probably have a positive case, and they, they were exactly right. So the first case was at Ramsey County, um, and then over the weekend, there was a second case that was identified in um, in Carver County. So this is, as you can tell, a pretty quickly evolving situation. And just to give you a sense of what that's looking like, on Friday, um, the U.S. had 164 cases, 11 deaths, and there were 19 states that were reporting. Um, and this Monday, yesterday, um, that's actually jumped to 423 cases, um, 19 deaths, and 35 states with the um, District of Columbia also reporting. So we're seeing um, this changing uh, pretty rapidly, and um, it's taking actually a lot of staff resources just to keep up with what's, what's happening within the, the area. Of that um, 423 cases, basically 72 of them are travel-related. Uh, 29 have been identified as person-to-person, -person, um, but the bulk of them, 322, are still under investigation, and we're not sure where those came from. It could be either travel or person-to-person. So, um, so changing very quickly, um, I was on a, a, a radio station yesterday, WJON, with George Morse from Center Care, and he said something that I think was really helpful. And um, he basically said, are we afraid of this virus? No, we're not afraid of it, but we need to respect this virus. We know that, you know, we have people that um, get sick. Um, some people have no symptoms at all, but we do have deaths related to this, so we really need to respect this. So if you look at the first slide that's up here, um, this gives a really good, I think, um, example of why is it that we're doing um, the strategies that we're doing, the case investigations that we're doing, uh, the early testing or as testing as much as what we possibly can to identify those, and then based on that, doing things such as, you know, closing schools, um, discouraging large gatherings, those kinds of things. So if you look at that purple um, curve that's on there, that's basically if we did nothing. What would happen is we'd get this big, huge peak of cases, um, and then it would eventually go down. But that big, huge peak, we cannot sustain that. We don't have the resources in our medical, we don't have the resources in government, we don't have the resources in public health to be able to respond to such a bolus of people and cases. So what we do is we implement these strategies to keep that lower, which is that uh, the lower um, curve with the uh, slanted lines. That's our way of trying to control the number of cases that are out there. It may extend it for a longer period of time, but at least our resources are going to be able to respond um, and we won't overwhelm all of our systems. So the next slide, um, hopefully, <laughs> come on, uh, is, just shows you, there we go, 
is the phases. So we are right now in that containment and community mitigation phase um, where we're, again, what we're doing is monitoring what's happening. We're actually um, testing individuals. For those individuals, we're actually either quarantining them, i.e. those are individuals that have been exposed um, but not sick, or isolating people who are ill um, in some way, shape, or form, either um, at home or in the hospital if they are sick. Um, we are not in a pandemic mitigation yet. Um, that just means more resources need to go towards testing, more of the isolation, those kinds of things in that same sort of um, hoop or, or uh, scoop there that you see. And then once we start seeing um, less and less cases, we can move into the demobilization where we can stop a lot of the work that we're actually doing. And then with that, I'll let Erin share kind of what we've been doing. Uh, so as you know, we have our emergency operations plan that's an all-hazard plan. Um, and we prepare for being able to bring in the key players that we need to help us make decisions. Um, and one of the things we've implemented is our disaster response action team. It is a group made up of um, administration, um, property services, <coughs> um, environmental services, um, the sheriff's office, highway, public health, and emergency management. And we have come together twice now to talk about where really do we need to bring in county resources to help manage and identify what's happening in the community. Um, we as well continue to meet with public health and emergency management um, on a weekly basis to have an appreciation of the changing environment and situation and are now looking at bringing in additional people to help make sure that all the critical roles are being filled in our um, information discovery and then res um, subsequent response. Um, we as well are working on a public education campaign. Um, we do have information on the county's website um, and on the point as well where people are able to go to get information. Um, we're directing them to both the Minnesota Department of Health and then the um, CDC um, as they do a really good job of keeping that information up to date. Um, you as well may have noticed the posters um, and things hanging in the entryway coming in today, um, remembering um, to wash our hands and then cover our cough um, if we're sick. Um, just a good reminder to the people visiting our county facilities as well as all of our employees as well. Um, and then lastly, we're engaging with our community partners whether that's local school districts, if it's the healthcare system. Um, we talked to St. Cloud State this morning, um, all of our first responder community to make sure that we have a consistent message and people know where they can get resources and their questions answered. And maybe just lastly, we have um, moved internally into an incident command structure mm -hmm. um, and we have started using the um, ICS forms that Aaron um, has as part of emergency management to document the time and the activities that we're doing. Um, there are several bills, either federally or in Minnesota, that either have passed and have been signed or are in the process um, for additional dollars. And that way we're um, actually documenting the time that we're using so that if in the future we could get reimbursed for that time, then we have that documentation there. So if there's any other questions for us. Any questions by board members? Actually, you answered my question with your last Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Aaron, can you, uh, you haven't been in, uh, to the board for some time, uh, let folks know what your job title is and what your area of responsibility is? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm the emergency manager. Um, and the emergency management department, we are responsible for our all-hazard planning. Um, so any type of emergency on a large scale that happens to impact the county, um, and we do um, emergency planning. Um, we help with training the people who are responsible for carrying out that plan. And then we develop disaster exercises and drills to make sure that those plans are ready when we need to implement them. Okay. Uh, yeah. Carol. Did you wait? Did you have any follow up with, with Aaron? No. Okay. I can wait. That's good. No, I can wait too. Hmm. Uh, actually, one of the things I was uh, thinking about was this weekend somebody had sent out a hoax message mm -hmm. about there being a local um, confirmed report. Yes. So I'm wondering just kind of what the counter communication is. It's hard because like, I really appreciate when, what you were repeating about we should respect, not fear. But when people start <laughs> seeing things like that, it can really move kind of not only shoulders up to panic. but. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that was part of our um, reasoning for looking at public education and communication and how do we make sure that we're getting the most current and the most accurate information out. Um, so we're, we looked basically at sort of three levels, I guess you could say. One is, you know, we have a responsibility to our community. So what is it that we need to put onto our website? And so there is on the Stearns County website a coronavirus area that people can click on and we're keeping that current. We're trying to update that at least weekly. Um, it's hard to keep all the information up to date, so we're trying to get that updated weekly. Um, the second one is to all of our partners. So we do a lot of partner work with our clinics, our hospitals, our schools, um, and so we're keeping them current. Um, we've learned from past situations that when we think we, there's nothing to tell, it's okay for us to be quiet and they're telling us, no, just tell us it's okay that nothing new has changed or here's what we're doing. So, so on a weekly basis, we're gonna be talking with our, inter our external partners that we have. And then we also have created a spot on the point for our own employees since we are an employer. And we're keeping that current, again, at least weekly um, with as much information. And anytime we would hear a hoax, I think we would wanna put that on there. This is not true this is what is actually happening. So those are kind of the three areas that we've developed in, in putting together some communications. I think one additional point too is that we have what we call a joint information center um, and the county and Centra Care at Safe right. Hospital are working together to make sure that any messages we're forwarding or that they're forwarding, we're all kind of in agreement with yeah. so that we're not having contradictory information that's going out. Um, so that's been a big collaborative effort with Renee and Dr. Morris mm -hmm. to make sure that that coordination is happening. Okay, anything else uh, by board member? Uh, I mean, I hate to put a stigma on Erin, but uh, <laughs> I was asked to describe what she actually does at a, uh, Okay, it was a happy hour gathering. And I said, <laughs> and I said Aaron's in charge of disasters. And uh, uh, so uh, whenever she shows up, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, oh God, uh, what's she going to tell us about it? No. Yeah, I mean, it isn't, you know, I'd still rather see you first than to see the county attorney, but, uh, you know, I, uh, we're uh, <laughs> letting go. Uh, Thank you very much for Thank that you. update. Thank you. And uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, public access well, form. Mr. Chair. Uh, well, first of all, anything else on the agenda approval? Otherwise, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. That's a good plan. Okay. Anything Is that a motion? No additions. Okay. We have a second. Did second. we get a second? I wasn't paying second. attention. Okay. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Now oh, the public access form. Uh, the instructions on the public access forum are anyone wishing to address the board on issues not found on today's agenda may do so at this time. Speakers are asked to approach a microphone. Individual comments are limited to three or four minutes. Total allotted time for the forum is 10 minutes and a citizen can speak at the public access forum only once per month. Uh, county board members will not engage in dialogue with the speakers but rather refer the matter to the appropriate county department or put it on a subsequent uh, uh, county uh, meeting agenda. Uh, any members of the public that uh, wish to uh, address the board now, step up to the microphone, give us your name and your address, and uh, let us know what's on your mind. My address is 25 Riverside Avenue Northwest, Melrose, Minnesota. Five six three five two, and I was here uh, last month expressing my concern over um, uncons unconstitutional laws that are enacted by our state government. Uh, as many of you may know, there are a number of counties in the state of Minnesota right now that are becoming dedicated Second Amendment counties, basically stating that they will not provide funds for law enforcement to enact unconstitutional laws. And uh, we have a, a movement here in Stearns County that is requesting the same thing, that Stearns County become a dedicated Second Amendment county uh, that would um, uh, state that they would not provide um, law enforcement to enact or to enforce unconstitutional laws. Um, with that, you did 
uh, send me a letter from the last time I spoke, and I appreciate that. Thank you for that. A couple of points on that letter that I read that I'd like to make note of. Uh, you had, um, or Michael Williams had responded and said that uh, we will not adopt a general policy position, do not, do not make proclamation or adopt resolutions unless the topic of those actions is directly related to our budget and the delivery of our program and services. Uh, to that, I would just make uh, a note to say that I believe uh, there is, uh, the commission would uh, allot funding for law enforcement, which would uh, directly oppose that, that statement. So there is uh, budgetary concerns in this. Uh, also, at the end, it says, please understand that the county board members have previously, previously taken an oath of office pledging to support and defend the Constitution of this state of Minnesota uh, in the United States, including all of its provisions and amendments. And I just, I guess I need clarity on that. If you've all taken a, an oath to uphold the Constitution and the Second Amendment, uh, does that mean you would not allow uh, taxpayer funding for law enforcement to enforce unconstitutional laws? And so just some clarity on that. At some point, um, if there is a way we can uh, have some sort of a forum where we can discuss, this would be awesome. Uh, if any of you have any recommendations on how to do that, that'd be great. Uh, other than that, that's my case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, comments by the public? Come on up and uh, give us your name and address and uh, we'll hear your concern. Yeah, my name is Bob Walls. Uh, my address is 214 Main Street, El Rosa, Minnesota, 56325. And just a, a, a follow-up to what uh, Kurt was saying here, and I think there's probably a buzzword out there going around called red flag laws that are actually in the legislature right now. And I just wanted to give an example of how dangerous that can be, not only unconstitutional, but actually very dangerous. Um, two years ago in 2018, the state of Maryland had, has the red flag law and at 5.30 in the morning, the police showed up to the doorstep of Gary Willis, a 61-year-old resident of Anne Arundel County, and he had come to the door, answered the door, and two police officers stated, yeah, they were there. He had his gun because he wasn't sure who was at his door at 5.30 in the morning. And so once they explained who they were, he set the gun down, and when they told him why they were there, things kind of took a different turn. And he went to take, retrieve his gun, and there was a struggle. The gun discharged, and the police officers killed him. What happened was, was his sister and himself have got, had gotten into an argument. While well, she thought it, as a way to get back at him, she was going to file a red flag and have his guns taken away. Well, she found out that, <laughs> you know, that's not exactly the right thing to do in a situation like that. And it ultimately cost him his life. <laughs> his, his Second Amendment was violated, his Fourth Amendment, his Fifth Amendment. And so I just wanted to follow up on that. And I've been talking with some of the, the sheriff and some of the members here with uh, through email and I, I think it would be you know important at some point here down the road if we can get together and have a meeting and you know discuss this further and so I just wanted to, to, to clarify the dangers of some of these unconstitutional laws thank you thank you very much uh, anyone else uh, uh, want to uh, address the county board and open forum Steve? Could I maybe suggest, Mr. Chair, that uh, at some point we could maybe have administration set up maybe a meeting with the sheriff to just have an open discussion? Well, or? it's on the end of the agenda. I mean, how mm. much you want? Well, but that's to discuss the policy. Uh, okay. Beyond that, what are we going to Which we talk could about? still, we could do it that too, I guess. Come on, Steve. you got to come up with some ideas here. What, what, what do you... Well, I'm just, what, I where, spoke where to the sheriff you, last night, and, you know, he'd be willing to sit down with residents and anybody else to... And I talked to him this morning, and he's willing to talk today. Okay. I mean, geez. I mean, eventually the horse will be dead, okay? 
Okay. So, Mr. Still got a lot so of are, you just, are you just talking about the yeah. sheriff meeting with them? I mean, because obviously the sheriff is really pretty good about meeting with groups when they ask, which is different than us meeting as a board. Is that what your thought was? Yeah, with, with yeah. the citizens and yeah, with anybody the who else okay. wants to. But I'm okay. I mean, I know the sheriff's going to be here and the county attorney. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, when, you know, when he does his morning handshake. But they might have more. He came by and uh, I said, hey, we get to that point. Uh, would you be willing to address the board? <coughs> Mr. Chair, <coughs> following our protocol, we shouldn't be addressing that right now. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah, consent agenda. I'll move the consent agenda. <laughs> I'll second it. All righty. And all those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Public works. Good morning. Jody morning. County Engineer. Uh, my items start on your agenda packet, page 30H. And for my first item, I'm asking the board to approve an authorized final payment on the 2019 gravel crushing contract. Uh, you'll note that it is quite a bit under estimate or under contract price of just about seven, just over $7,000 under the contract price. The contractor did not crush the amount we requested, but we're finaling out the contract. So I'm asking the board to approve and authorize that payment. Okay. Uh, the board like to approve and authorize this? Uh, so is there a motion to do so? I'll move. Thank you, Jeff. Second. And thanks for the second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? For my next item, I'm asking the board to authorize advertising for bids for the resurfacing of the Richmond Highway Department parking lot. Uh, you may recall this project was included in the county CIP and it was designated to be funded out of the road and bridge fund balance. Um, I'd like the board to approve a bid opening date of April 2nd, 2020. So moved. Second. <clears throat> Motion has been made and seconded uh, to approve this. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, for my next item, I'm asking the board to approve setting a public hearing for the turn back of 233rd Street to Wakefield Township. And this is a little bit unique in that um, when the Trunk Highway 23 improvements were done through Coal Spring and it was expanded to four lanes quite a while ago, when the state turned back sections of road that they had taken over for construction, they inadvertently turned this section road back to us. Wakefield Township has been maintaining this since it was turned back to us and it was only recently that it was brought to our attention that it was technically ours. Uh, Wakefield Township, I've met with the board and they are willing to take it back but we still need to go through that process of a public mm -hmm. hearing. Um, I would typically like to do that in conjunction with a regular town board hearing because the hearing does need to be held in the township. Uh, the township is right now determining if they are going to move up the times of their regular town board meetings. So I will know that time, whether it's going to be 5.30 or 7.30. Um, I'll know that after probably today. But I would like the board at this point to at least approve the public hearing date of April 2nd, 2020. Um, I do need at least three board members to be there, so hopefully that would work out. It's a Thursday evening, and it would be at the Wakefield Town Hall. And so you'd let us know when that... I would let you know what time it was. I will send you a notice, but just as a side note, if there are three of you that know you absolutely cannot make it, then I'll have to go back to the township to figure out a new date to set. Well, okay. Um, the... Is this... I'm, I'm you know, I, it's been a long time since I really made myself familiar with uh, township protocol. Is this something they can do at a regular board meeting or is it something they have to do at the annual meeting? Can you it's, help me out? It's a public hearing that has to be held by the county board in the township. And since okay. we would like the town board to be there since they're taking okay. the road, our standard practice has been to hold that public hearing just before a regular town board meeting. Um, if it's expected to be controversial, we would allow a little bit more time. In this case, I've had those discussions with the town board and they understand that this actually should have been turned back to them right out of the gate. And so um, I don't anticipate this to be controversial. In fact, I think the town board thought it would take about 10, 15 minutes, but I'd like to give a little bit of time just in case. Jeff, so, your hand went off accidentally yeah, or do you uh, actually no, have a... I know I, I had planned to attend the Stearns Electric Business Meeting that night. 
I know Steve will probably be there too. Um, and that's at seven o'clock in Melrose. Okay, so let me check. Uh, what time would you anticipate this meeting being? Um, it will either be at, uh, if their meetings get changed to 6.30, then it would probably be at 6. Again, it would last probably about 15 minutes. But I, I mean, this is just it's outside. early enough I would attend. Yeah, what's that date? Again? April 2nd, it's a Thursday. April 2nd. April 2nd. I'm good. I may have a conflict, it depends on what time. But I'll try to. And if, that. if necessary, we can certainly push this to May. If the first Thursday in May works better, then I can have you set that public hearing date with at a time to be determined by the township. I didn't think I was going to be involved, so I didn't pay attention to the time. What would be the time again? Um, it would sure. either be at about six o'clock or it would be at about seven o'clock. I know for sure I can the first Thursday in May. I'm not I'm, sure about the first Thursday in April. I'd have I'm to good for the first Thursday in May also. I'm good on the second. What do you, uh, what, what's the preference of uh, our August oh. membership then? You don't want to do March 2nd, you want to do May? I can't say either. Yeah, not April. I don't know. Well, and I can go back to the township and request that we have it the first Thursday in May. Okay. All right. I can't make, I can't make either one, so. Okay. The first Thursday in May. Put it down. Okay. So in that case, I'm asking the board to set the public <laughs> hearing for May. What is the date? Well, I'm in the motion. If I the motion to uh, for May seventh. At a time to be determined by the well, township. May seventh. All right. Well, if I ever get caught, I'll make that myself, motion. I'll take a motion. How's that? But I'll make the motion. This is taking me longer than I anticipated. <laughs> okay. Six o'clock. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second to uh, uh, have uh, meet with the town board at uh, May seventh at six o'clock. Uh, consider this uh, this matter. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Yeah, great. We got something done. Life holds. My next item on page 46 in your agenda packets is I'm asking the board to authorize advertising for bids to replace three culverts along county roads. These are large culverts that are um, much more efficiently replaced with larger equipment than what the county has. Um, the, they're along co County Road 130, County Road 9, and County Road 17. The, one, the pipe underneath County Road 130 needs to be replaced well in advance of that resurfacing project. Um, they are in very poor condition, so we've got some concerns about them. This will come out of our maintenance budget. Uh, it's a significant cost, but we are figuring out how that can be done, and it needs to be done soon before we are impacting traffic. I'm asking the board to approve a bid opening date of April 2nd, 2020. Okay. Uh, questions, otherwise the motion would be appropriate. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, thank you, Terrell. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right. So for my next item, I'm asking the board to authorize advertising the sale of excess right-of-way along County State Aid Highway 84. This is along the Highway 15, 33rd Street South um, interchange. The sale of this property was previously advertised and we had no bidders. Uh, the interested party has had several discussions with county staff and has since accepted the value of that property as determined by our assessor's office. I'm asking the board to authorize um, an advertise or a bid opening date of April 9th with a minimum bid of $8,910, and that set by statute is 90% of the market value. So I'll, moved. So I'll second. <laughs> I'll second. All righty. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. My next item for information only, um, based on the results of the doodle poll I sent out, we are going to hold our road program public input meeting at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, May 5th at the Highway Department office in Waite Park. That's a half hour earlier than it normally starts, but um, based on some comments we've received, uh, we think that timeline will be a little bit better than a 7 p.m. start. And then the spring road tour will be held on Friday, May 15th, starting at 8 o'clock a.m. at the Highway Department office in Waite Park. That tour generally ends between 3 and 3.30 back at the Highway Department. 
And then I do have one miscellaneous item that's come so up. If I had, did, are you talking Tuesday, May 5th, or are you talking Wednesday, May 6th for the uh, public hearing? Tuesday, May 5th. Okay, thank you. Jody on the road tour again? And they're typically, Sorry. you're talking what time? 6.30 p.m. would be May the public 15th. meeting. Right. And then the road tour would depart around 8 a.m. on Friday, May 15th. And we would get back between 3 and 3.30, generally. And so to clarify, we'll have two evening meetings that week because we just approved the other ones. Right. So we just have to remember that. Remember what? That we have two. We just set a public hearing. Oh. <laughs> yes. We if, think if we'd been thinking, we might have considered something different. This will be fun. Well, usually I make a note and then I, a <laughs> mental note, and then I lose my note. Uh, anyway. Uh, then also, just as a miscellaneous item, I'm asking the board to authorize advertising for bids for CP 073-138-020, and that is the roundabout at County Road 138 and 28th Avenue. And I'm asking the board to set a bid opening date of April 9th. Okay. So moved. Okay, we got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. And one last side note, and then I will leave, I promise. Um, we are setting a public information meeting for the intersection improvements located up in Brockway Township at the intersections of County Road 1 with 17 and County Road 1 and County Road 2. Those intersections are within a stone's throw of each other. And that will be Tuesday, April 7th at 5.30, it'll go from 5.30 to 7.30, and this is a public input meeting. We'll have several options for both of those intersections just to get the, the general input of those people who live within a certain distance of that intersection and anybody else who is interested because we will be advertising it as well. Uh, you'll all get a notice, but I just wanted to give you a heads up so you where, can get- Where will that be held? It'll be at the Brockway Town Hall. Okay. And that's all I have unless anyone has anything for me. Jody, on that date was April 7th? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Okay, thank, thank you. you, Jody. Environmental Services. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I have uh, two items and a miscellaneous for you. Becky Schlorf is here to present our items, and they start on packet page 53. This is the first agenda item is to authorize approval of the 2019 county feedlot annual report. And um, this also is used to calculate some additional um, funding based on what other counties submit. Um, our performance credits will result um, in some additional money. As you can see, um, it ranges from $14,000 to $25,000. Um, basically, um, we've met all of our requirements. We've met the 7% inspection rate. Um, we did have an annual review, too, for the 2019, and we met all of the minimum program requirements, 100% of those again. Um, and then just a side note on this report, this is reporting the things that the state um, is looking at, but we do additional work for the state as well, so at least 10 inspections. Um, for complaints or investigation are not counted by the state. Um, and then our social media um, outreach that we started is also not counted by them at this point. Um, so with that, I'll look for a motion um, or questions. Okay, any questions of Becky? If not, uh, the appropriate action would be for we move to approve the feedlot annual report. All right. I'll second it with a, just a question or a comment. All right. What's your question, Steve? Becky, have, uh, has MPCA been, I know at one point you mentioned about the long form and reporting mm -hmm. sooner. Where is that in the process? Um, so, and, and I'll be getting that into that a little bit with oh, my next okay. presentation. Okay. If you'd they like it. Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, so the next agenda item is just we need to vote. No, we need to vote. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Jeez, I remembered something. <laughs> See, you know, your memory comes back after that <laughs> surgery. <laughs> <laughs> oh. What surgery? 
Yeah, the fact you can laugh, Joe, yeah. is a good thing. Good <laughs> Gee. Uh, I suppose we can get something done again. Uh, what do you got there, Bob? Um, so the next agenda item is just informational. I'd like to present some. Yeah, um, we ain't actually doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> you can sit back and relax, I guess. <laughs> Um, so this is an update on the wetland program as well as the feedlot program um, for wetlands. Um, just a list of the programs or the um, um, approvals and reviews that we do. Um, and then at the bottom of the slide, as you can see, on average, we make us um, 771 contacts per year. So we do um, have a lot of um, interaction with the public. Um, some of the highlights for the program that I think would, that you would find interesting and important um, are the violations. Over the years, the violations have decreased. And this is a result of policy changes within the DNR and the county in that the DNR, if they have a vi potential violation, they call the environmental services staff and find out information before calling it a violation. And the staff here do the same as well. So the actual violations have dropped as a result in part because of that. Um, the next slide is regarding wetland replacement and banking. And um, you can see that the number of replacement plans is slightly down, um, and the banking applications is, is, is kind of a blip. Those banking applications, as many of you know, can take several years, on average about two years for approval. It's a very lengthy process. Um, and we're only counting on this slide those that have been completed and approved. Right now in the county, we have two active applications, but an additional two to three that are going through the process. Um, and as you know, credits in this region are in need, and I think at the legislature right now, they're looking to appropriate some funding for that as well. So if, without, if you don't have any questions on the wetland program, I'm going <coughs> to switch back to feedlots. In 2019, the feedlot staff remained the same, and with the Melrose office, this is just some statistics on the coverage out there, um, and it's about the same as, as the prior year. Um, I'll be reassessing that in 2020 with the move of our office out to Service West to see if the usage of Melrose remains um, as it is or if it further drops. And with the state also now doing an, a new online registration for feedlots, if that might also make a difference with the service level needed at Melrose. The number of feedlots in Stearns County is shown here, and you can see the changes are very minimal. We've pretty much remained the same. With this graph, though, you can see um, on the far left, our small sites that the state does not count are increasing year after year. And then the medium-sized feedlots, the 50 to 299 animal unit sites, are continuing to decline. Mm -hmm. But overall, we remain about the same. <clears throat> animal unit distribution, this is just showing our numbers have increased slightly. Um, and this is just representing what's registered, not necessarily what is on site. So it's what's allowed on site. Um, and about one-fifth of our feedlot animal units are on um, 52 sites, and those are the NPDS sites in the, in the county. Feedlot permits for 2019 dropped significantly, 34% decline because of dairy prices and markets, and so um, it, it has averaged around the 100, and we were at 73. Um, regarding non-compliance, we tend to just look at open lot runoff and, and um, unpermitted pits. And um, with those numbers, we slightly increased. So we have 226 feedlots that are non-compliant at this point. Um, some of the factor in that is um, right now, at least for 2019 and expected for 2020, the federal dollars have declined. And there's not as much funding for feedlot projects anymore. Um, so um, I'm not sure that we'll continue to see a lot of improvements over the next few years with that component. Um, this is also showing, and this is updated from 
Oh, okay, Marlis did get that in. Yep, so you can flip it back. Um, the PowerPoint, not in your packet, but in um, online um, is correct. Um, so this is showing the um, bracket of feedlots um, in size and noncompliance. And the noncompliance is primarily that 100 to 299 animal unit size. Um, but they are decreasing in their noncompliance. The category that's increasing in noncompliance is the less than 10 animal unit sites, and those are the ones that the state does not count for us overseeing, but they are the ones that are having a little bit more struggle. Becky, let me interrupt. Um, mm -hmm. is, they're decreasing in noncompliance. Are they decreasing in noncompliance because they're making corrections or because they're disappearing? Um, it could be partially because of that. They may be, um, in some cases, a lot of our non-compliant is dairy and or beef. And so it may be in situations where they're converting from dairy to beef that they're becoming compliant okay. or their animal numbers are dropping. So it, it may be some management, management changes or on-site changes, or it could be also that they are um, becoming deactivated. Okay. And since I interrupted, I'll ask my other question that we're going to ask at the end. Um, with the number of feedlots that we have diminishing, but we still have are we, the number of cows actually in Stearns County continues to grow. Is that correct? So that, the larger herds are getting larger, and just we're losing the smaller herds. Is that correct? Correct, and that again is what's registered or permitted, but what's on actually on site. We don't. I know. can't speak to that. We don't count them. But <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't count noses oh. and tails. <laughs> but, okay. All right. But. Um, so the other component of noncompliance that we look at is manure record keeping, and this is also a factor into water quality. Um, with, in Stearns County, we are now, we've reviewed 51% of the sites that are required to keep records, and about 36% are noncompliant. And so that is actually making progress. In fact, over the last two years, we've had 40 sites become compliant. And um, this, these are the numbers again for um, the end of 2019. But this February 2020, we did have an information session um, with um, a partner, a couple of partners, Soil and Water Conservation District, the North Fork Crow River Watershed District, and the University of Minnesota Extension Service. We had 15 participants, and we did a pre-quiz pre and a post-quiz, and we saw a really significant increase in their knowledge within the workshop time period. So we're looking to do some more of those. Um, my last slide is regarding program changes um, within the feedlot program in the next year or so. And MPCA is preparing for online registration, as I mentioned earlier. This is expected perhaps in April, and this is a year behind. I'll let you know that Stearns County is planning to send out paper forms to every feedlot owner. And not, we don't plan to change that at this time. We know people like paper. And, and or may not have access to the internet. Um, and so we will, as staff, input the data onto the, into the system for the, for the owners, um, but we'll send them the paper, they can call us in. We may even hold some open house workshops or something to help um, get the registrations done. Um, MPCA has proposed um, a concept for raising their revenue um, for feedlots, and that includes charging a fee for registration and state permits. And this is not something that we as a county have control over, and perhaps you've heard of this. Um, I didn't bring the proposed changes or the proposed fees with me today, I'm sorry about that, but there is a comment period that ends this Friday, March 13th, online and um, the Minnesota Association of County Feedlot Officers, which we belong to along with um, Association of Minnesota Counties, is writing a letter of non-support and offering another suggestion that the MPCA work with the legislature for a general revenue fund increase um, and that they um, state how they're going to be helping producers with that money. Um, Steve, this is uh, regarding Commissioner Notch, regarding your question. The documentation, paper, and digital requirements of the MPCA has increased significantly over the last 10 years, and that's also to show accountability for the dollars that we receive as a county. And so we're trying to work with AMC to balance that, and um, some of our members did meet with the Commissioner of MPCA, and we may have a facilitated session with the MPCA management um, coming up 
to help facilitate the partnership and balancing the time we can work with producers versus the time we spend on documentation. So I'm hoping that we see some um, improvements with that relationship. And that's all I have for you. Steve. Becky, I believe the Dairy Advisory Committee also sent a letter. That's correct. Kind of a, opposing the fee structure. Correct, yep, you're right. Because they're at, the, at that meeting, or committee meeting, it was kind of spilled out, or it's really a net. I mean, it doesn't really gain anything, I don't think, anyway. I don't think that their advisory committee figured it did either, so. Mm -hmm. Anything, any other, any other questions? Um, the amount of regulations and reporting and permits that uh, feedlots require uh, continues to grow. What I would appreciate, I don't know if either one of you, is uh, a listing of what all of those requirements are. Here's what happens if you're on this side of the dais, uh, and conceivably even staff, uh, you, you jump to the conclusion that you're the only people that require approvals for this stuff. And the reality is, uh, you know, uh, if you're an actual operator, for all of the ap approvals that you need to operate, you begin to be able to empathize with Custer at the Little Bighorn, where in the heck did all these people come from? Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's only part of the picture, and I think we're passing up an opportunity to let the public know, wait a minute, these operators do an awful lot to uh, get approvals to, to operate. And, uh, you know, what reminded me of this is uh, this morning when I walked in to the back room before the meeting, uh, there was an informal discussion between two of you about what daycare providers have to do now, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, we're getting that way. Well, we've been that way for a while. And it doesn't hurt to remind ourselves that's what happened. Steve, you had something. No, I you didn't? just listening. Anybody else? Okay, you developed a twitch. <laughs> Uh, I hope things get better for you. Thank you. Uh, I'm working on it. Oh, good, 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 yeah. Uh, anyway. The one with the middle. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you. I do have one miscellaneous item, um, and that is in front of you related to my favorite topic um, currently, which is the 2020 census. Um, what you're going to be receiving in the mail, hopefully, this next week is your invitation to respond to the 2020 census. So what you're going to receive is information um, in a letter form like this. Mm -hmm. This box will contain a URL code, and if you use that URL code, you will go to the census, and you'll be able to fill out your form electronically. There is a specific code that will be in the next box that you put in so that it is your information, that information for your household specifically. There is another way to do it if you don't get a code. You will also be allowed to go onto the census and put in your address and then um, enter that information as well. There will also be uh, other opportunities uh, for you to comply and um, answer the census. And they do have a note in Spanish on the bottom, which I will move up. Um, saying if you want to go online and complete this form in Spanish, you may do so as well. So um, they actually have the census in Spanish and available. So we want to make sure people know it's, it is census time. They're getting ready. Officially, census day is April 1st. But the more people we can get in and responding to the census, the better it is, the faster it is, and the fewer times enumerators will have to go out and ask people to fill out the census. So that's what I have for you today. Questions by anybody? Terrell's got a question. <laughs> well, I suppose it's just we talked about this earlier on the census website. While the forms aren't in 
a variety of languages. There's a number of videos, including in Somali, German, et cetera, that if people are, have questions or trying to figure this out, they can, can go view or get the information about what's being requested. Yes, and we are making those things available. Um, one of the things I, I worked on is with public health and putting out uh, posters in multiple languages so they know where to go to get that information right. so that they can see it um, and taking those opportunities to put information out in more than one language so that we get uh, as many people to respond as possible. The other concerned area is renters, people who don't own that house often feel and they move a lot so they don't always think they need to respond and they really, it's critical that we get them to respond to the census. So anybody that's in a rental property, be responsible for those people in your, um, in your unit and get everybody counted. So if there are inf uh, people with questions, they can certainly call uh, environmental services, they can call me, the city of St. Cloud um, as well and the complete count committee, uh, there is information the Minnesota Census um, also has a lot of information out there. So that's what I have for you today. Anything else by board members? Joe has something. Yeah. Um, Shelly, so then in a home or an apartment, somebody not responding to the request by mail, uh, how will they be counted? What will happen is the census takers will um, come out to that uh, apartment and they are allowed to be in the apartment. Um, there are statutes that relate to that, allowing census takers uh, through the property management people to go in and they will come to the door and ask those people. So just like if you have a single family residential dwelling, the same will occur at an apartment that the census takers will go to the apartment and look for those parties that had not responded uh, to the online form. Okay. So, and, and of course, those with the language barriers, we're gonna take, make sure we take care of those people that have that language yep. barrier? There are um, cue cards as well that those census takers have and they will have access to. Um, translators as well. So there are multiple ways, and the state of Minnesota has taken a very active role in making sure they have um, Spanish, Hmong, and Somali language because in the state, those are our three most common um, languages that we need to have information as well as English. Okay. So they are doing a, a concerted effort to make sure we get all of those populations counted. And for clarification, census taker cannot enter the home and cannot enter the individual apartment unit. They can enter the apartment building. Correct. Yeah. So right. what they will do is be in the hallway, they will knock on the door yep. and request and let them know and they will have badge and they will have ID and it's secure information, it doesn't get um, published, um, the individual information for 72 years. So it's a safe, secure way, and it's not open and available to other agencies uh, within the government. Yeah. And of course, my, my concern is, uh, obviously those numbers are vitally important to us because we get funding for each individual that's in our county. Correct. And we wanna make sure that we, are accountable for everybody that's here, and we don't want people to be fearful, fearful not responding to it because they're afraid uh, uh, to respond. Correct, so the more people we get to respond, the more money that's available within our community for those services that we utilize every day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. Jeff Johnson is going to Come on down and confuse some issues for us. Boy, just getting you guys seated was almost. Uh, <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Jeff Johnson, Property Services Director, and uh, to my right is uh, Randy Lahr, Assistant County Assessor, and uh, Jake Pitty, County Assessor. Uh, we're here before you today because uh, on uh, packet page 83, agenda item F, uh, these gentlemen will be providing you with an update on the 2020 property assessment. So with that, I'll turn it over to them, and uh, they have a PowerPoint presentation that they will share with you. Uh, 
and uh, also some pertinent information regarding the upcoming mailing of notice of evaluation and classifications and tax statements. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jake and Randy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, today we've got the 2020 assessment overview. This is just going to be a quick quick overview. We usually do a, a little more detailed one later on, but um, we'll talk about our property assessment work, our quintile inspections, market conditions, et cetera, um, and then a little bit about this, the new Stearns County website at the end. So um, our first slide here, we've got uh, assessment work that started last April and continues through May uh, through the board season. Um, our work was completed on February 28th, which was similar to last year. We, we completed our work on the 27th. So um, just kind of a, a day of the week thing was all the only difference there. Um, and our notices of valuation and classification are going to be combined as they were two years ago. And we hope to uh, have those in the mail the week of the 16th. Um, last I heard, it, it, they'll probably go out in the mail on the 17th of, of March, and they take about three days to hit the mailbox. So. We're looking at probably Friday the 20th um, and then maybe Saturday the 21st that they'll be in the mail. So we'll plan to uh, ramp, up, ramp up our staff in the office on, uh, on Monday and Tuesday afterwards. So we'll get those value calls coming in. Um, our uh, assessment this past year, we were at 99.7%. As you can see on the top there, uh, the statewide was about 94.6. We fall in that orange part of the pie chart down at the bottom. Uh, we're, we're in with 41 counties, which is good. We've, as you can see, we've uh, we've increased that every year. Not sure if we can get a whole lot better than 99.7, but we'll try again next year. Um, but we'll we'll see what happens there. And I don't know if you had anything to add to that at all, Randy. But no. oh, one thing too with the the value notices and the tax statements, um, being that they're both going to be in the same envelope, they're they're color coded. I believe the value notices are blue and the uh, tax statements will be lilac colored is what, right. what they said. So mm -hmm. um, very spring-like, I guess. So <laughs> um, let's see here. I won't be able to tell the difference. I know, right? <laughs> it's, they're pretty close. <laughs> we didn't choose the colors, but. Uh, they're not scented, are you? They might be. I, I, yeah, that would be, that would be nice. That's something we can request next year. <laughs> Uh, looking at the market conditions, so this is the agricultural and rural vacant land. Um, they don't have, they don't have a time adjustment, and neither does apartments, commercial or industrial. The only thing we had a time adjustment on this year was the residential and the seasonal rec sales. And you can see below what the time adjustments were. The top line shows the sales study for 19, which is the 2020 assessment, which we are currently um, sending value value notices out on. So. Pretty similar to the year before on the off-water stuff, we're at 4.71%, and the on-water is 4.92, so that came down a bit versus the prior year. Um, and that's on Western Stearns. The Eastern Stearns, kind of the, kind of a similar trend where, where the on-water stuff came down versus versus last year. Uh, same with Sartell, the on-water came down again. Um, off-water came down quite a bit, which that surprised us a little bit. It, it kind of was cut in half, but... Um, the one thing we did have Eden Valley, they are lumped in with Meeker County on their time trend, and so they're at 12 percent. And we we actually appealed that because we felt that half the sales, around half the sales, were in Meeker County and half were in Stearns County. And we talked to the Department of Revenue, and it's not very often that that a city is split almost in half on their sales like that. So we we tried to work um, work on that to see if we could get that appealed. They they weren't willing to to move it at this time but we're, we're going to do some more work on that and try because 12 and a half percent that's you know we, we kind of get lumped in with what Me meeker county's doing and you know our i think our assessment's pretty tight so uh, you know i would have liked to have seen us be more in that eastern sterns uh you know five or six percent but yeah um, just to <clears throat> comparison sake meeker county they get about i think it was 200 sales versus our Residential sales in our county is around a thousand, so it's just a larger sample of sales. So we think it would tie in better with a, a county with larger amount of sales to, you know, to, for a big time adjustment like that. So more so, to come on that. Yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll we'll do our magic on that and see if we can get something changed there. But at this time, it's staying that way. So Eden Valley is going to see a little bit bigger increase than than most of the rest of the county. Um, during the past assessment cycle, we processed almost 2,400 uh, electronic ECRVs. Um, you know, they, they were processed by our office down slightly from the year before, which was 2,460. So the number of sales were very similar to, to last year, down a little bit. And I don't think it was uh, necessarily 
that they were down. It was just not as many houses that, that were on the market for sale. Um, we verify everything, commercial, industrial, apartment, and agricultural, and any residential sales that appear out of the norm. So anything that looks kind of funny, we, we will call on that too. So mm -hmm. our, I think our data is pretty good. Um, our, our staff's done a great job of, of uh, calling on these sales and, and getting the best data that we can so we have the best comparables. Um, sales activity showing showing our volume of sales over last year um, the, the column in blue is the 2019 sales which is what our assessments based off of and you can see the apartment sales we had nine last year we had eight our ratio is around 88 uh, percent commercial we're at 32 sales last year we had 30 we're at 94 percent which we, we like to see um, industrial we usually don't have very many industrial sales um, so the the ratios kind of fluctuate a little bit more than than in the past. Um, residential, you know, again, around 1,200 qualified sales. We're at about 90%, which was nice to see that we were, we were up and not, not down. Um, res off water stuff, around 90% as well, as you can kind of carry, carry it on through down to the bottom. Uh, looks like we've got agricultural sales at sitting around 97 and 96%. So it was, it was nice to see that everything came in really well for us. Um, you know, our, our values were, were pretty solid. So Again, our, you know, it's a, it's a testament to our staff and, and the work that they've put in and, and uh, the verifications and everything that they've done, so. Jeff has a question. Yeah, I'm just looking up there. Industrial is at 105%. Now, that means that your assessed value was at 100, was 5% over what it actually sold for? Yep. Interpreting on, that correctly? On only two sales, so it's, oh, yeah, okay. it's hard to, with a small right. sample like mm -hmm. that, it's really hard to and get. And the uh, other one, okay, only one sale to rural bacon. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah so. Right. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I'm just going to point out, too, um, so when we have at least six sales, they consider that a, a large enough sample size. Uh, they like to see that ratio or not like, but they require us to get that between 90 and 100, 105% is what the, the state requires us to be at. So so the districts that were, you know, like the res, you can see is at 91. We're going to want to get that closer to the center part of that range that we just mentioned. So. Uh, just talking about some value changes on different property types, um, apartments. We, we saw changes of about one to six percent. I would say about five percent overall was was pretty typical. Um, a few of them we had to bump closer to ten percent based on some different factors, different sale data that we got. Um, and this is pretty pretty common. Uh, out west, Western Stearns is a little bit lower than what Eastern Stearns was seeing with some of the sales in uh, St. Joe and Sartell, which pushed pushed our values a little bit more. Um, commercial industrial, as you can see, there weren't a lot of industrial sales, but you know our changes were they fluctuated a bit from ten negative ten percent to plus ten percent, um, depending on the property type. Um, some different factors that that were involved there, but commercial industrial we moved about two percent uh, with without new construction that was only about a point three percent change. So not a lot of change on commercial industrial. We stayed pretty flat with that. Um, you know, there, there's still some signs of growth out there in the office, medical, hospitality, but it's just not, it's not moving like, like maybe we had thought in some of the, some of the large areas like Sartell and um, Way Park, you know, there's some land for sale out there too that, that really hasn't moved yet. So we're kind of waiting on some of that, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. I don't know if you have anything to add on that, but. No. Um, Seasonal racks, so that's our, our, our big driver here, but you know, the, the amount of sales are pretty similar. Like um, qualified sales are twelve twenty five versus twelve eighty one the previous year, so not a lot of change there. Um, you know, we're sitting right around ninety percent. So we didn't have to move values a whole lot. There was there was a you know a wider range in some areas where we, we did a lot of work. Um, some new appraisers went into some areas and, and picked up some value that, that was missed in previous years. Um, but changes of negative three to, to nine percent were, were the most common. So we, we're not going to see a lot of swings like we have in, in previous years. Um, you know, and, and varied by location and property type as usual. Um, supply and demand, affordability. You know, everything that, that we talked about last year is basically it's, it's the same. You know, there's not much difference. You know, um, houses aren't sitting on the market for very long. There aren't as many on the market as there as there have been. I think because people have you know bought those up, but my, my neighbor just put their house on the market and they had four showings the very next day and it was pending the next day. So it, it was that fast, but um, just still, it's still a hot market out there and um, we're, that's, that's kind of what we're seeing, so. 
bare land, this this would be the less than 34 and a half acres. So 34 and a half acres is what the Department of Revenue tells us is a true ag sale. So these are the ones that are less than that. So they're not the true ag sales. Um, you know, there's still a pretty good market for that. There's there's quite a bit of demand, and we're seeing some higher sale prices on those. I don't know. You've worked out in Rockville quite a bit, so you've got sent. Yeah, it's the you know, transitional area is where we see the biggest change that kind of you get a little ways out of the Wade Park, St. Cloud. There's kind of a perimeter there. We've seen a big change. Center part of the county, that Albany area, um, Farming Township, we've seen some big changes in, in land prices in that area. So it kind of feeds into what Jake's saying. People are looking for these types of parcels to build houses on and you know maybe hunt on it or whatever use. But we're seeing that pretty hot market on the on those rural residential sales. So this would be the agricultural sales, um, improved and unimproved, 34 and a half acres and larger. Land prices varied quite a bit depending on, on what was going on. We had some auction sales out there that were a little on the higher end, um, some things like that. But we tried not to change things a whole lot. They're focusing on the high quality land as usual. Larger tracts of land are always, always common. Um, you know, tillable values, if you look down towards the bottom there, till they remain flat seeing increases from 44.76 to 44.90, so barely a change, less than half a percent in change. So, uh, and the green acres values decreased slightly, so not a lot of change on either end there. So everything's gonna stay pretty flat versus last year. Yeah, I, I think our county is a very diverse county when it comes to agricultural, so it seems to really hold the market flat. We're surprised, you know, what the commodity price has been bad for a number of years now. Um, on a lot of different sectors, and it seems like those the egg land prices just continue to hang in there. Um, this year, we called uh, several um, fee appraisers or bank appraisers to find out if they're seeing similar things in, in their studies, and they're saying the same thing. It just it seems to be flat, even with the prices suffering. It's the land prices aren't coming down yet, and what the future holds, we don't know, obviously, but uh, we'll continue to monitor that. Yeah, and like uh, Mark Keenan, in our office always says, it's a once in a generation, you know, when, when your neighbor's selling their property, it's, it's your one time to, to grab that land that's right next door to you. So, you know, I think that might be part of the reason why that those values are staying where they're at. Um, market value increases. So this is the estimated market value. We grew about 4.2% between 19 and 20 assessments, similar to the 4.5% increase from the previous year. So very similar to last year again, which is kind of the theme of this whole this whole slideshow. Um, growth and taxable market value is just over 550 million for the 2020 assessment. New construction added 157 million in EMV for the 20 assessment. And this is a decrease of just under 19 million over the previous year. So new construction was down about 11 percent, and I think that might be attributable to the cost of of building right now. Right. I'd like to add that uh, perhaps another reason for that too is that uh, we had some large big ticket uh, commercial industrial properties uh, that came on one <coughs> year ago and this year we just didn't see that. And so that would account for that uh, large difference there. On uh, the second paragraph there, new construction made up 27% of the 580 million EMV increase. Uh, this is similar to last year when new construction accounted for about 29%. So. Kind of staying the same. Majority of new construction was reported in residential, followed by apartments, commercial, industrial, and, and agricultural was was last there. So, and here's some of the larger uh, projects that were completed or under construction this year. So we had a warehouse addition to Capital Granite out in Rockville. We had a new Central Minnesota Credit Union up at Sartell off of Pinecone Road. Cold storage warehouse for Rambler Trucking in Albany. New Centric Care Clinic in Albany. Albany had quite a few. They had an apartment coming up too, I think. So the hotel and convention center on Wade Park. New office building for felling trailers in Sox Center. New Strat Construction Building in St. Joe. Hundred and thirty unit apartment building finalized in Sartell this year. Forty unit apartment building finalized in Avon. 
here's a new home in St. Joe Township that we picked up. This would be one of the more Holy expensive ones that we added this year. Brand new stairs. <laughs> and talking about the number of new homes, so the new homes started as down about 14% from a year ago. So 2018, we were at around 300, and, and today we, we were at about 261. So again, a little less than last year, but kind of following the trend. So not a lot to, a lot of change report there, but. Yeah, here again, the construction costs seem to be pulling those numbers down. Uh, we hear it from residential developers too. It's a challenge to, to sell lots right now because of the construction costs to make it a package deal. So it's uh, interesting times right now with new, new home construction. And then with, with rates at all time lows again, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's kind of a give and take there. Um, and this is the final slide then. We are just talking about our information. Our plan this year is to scale back some of our web content as well as our assessor's report in an attempt to streamline our process as well as make things more reader friendly and ready for the new county website. As you guys know, there's a new county website coming on. So some ADA compliance things that we got to work on, um, things like that. So we're, we're trying to just streamline things a bit and uh, help help readers out a little more, be a little more reader friendly with everything. So yeah, not, not so much cut the content, but more more bullets and a little bit. You know, the younger generation, they like things more quick, 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 and versus more narrative stuff. So we're going to try to do more of that. So. Other than that, that was all we had. If you guys have any questions for us. Steve? On the tillable land, what did you recall what the highest price per acre sold last year? For a qualified sale? I yeah. I don't know the number. I would guess that would probably be in the sixes as well. Okay. Too. Yeah. I know that. that would get yeah. 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 That would be my guess anyway, but I don't know off the top of my head. We had okay. some auction prices that were higher than that, though, but those weren't qualified, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah and explain the concept of qualified sales, will you, Jake? Yeah, yeah. Um, qualified, you know, good market, arm's length market transaction, buyer and seller were both willing parties. Uh, you get into some of these, you know, neighbor, like a neighbor buying from a neighbor uh, related, you know, it might be relative sales, mm -hmm. things like that. Won't, those won't be qualified. Mm -hmm. um, some of the auction type sales, we kind of get into that. That's a little more of a gray area, but uh, you know, a lot of those have some issues with them too as well that, that kind of push them out of being qualified. So, you know, bottom line is, is it is it selling for a market price? And if it is, you know, more, more than likely it's qualified, but some of these auction sales, it's, you know, get into a bidding war. Mm -hmm. That's really not an arm's length transaction mm -hmm. at that point. So we, we try to not keep those in them. You know, otherwise we'd be, we'd be following a lot of these sales that are just out of, out of the range, so. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and it's it's obviously a good chunk of our sales are agricultural sales. So, it is probably the segment we spent the most time on verifying sales because there's so many. You know, there's a lot of for sale by owner property sales with with agricultural land. Um, I actually asked the question of one of the appraisers I called. I mentioned I called some bank and fee appraisers, and I said, "Well, how do you guys determine if it's a qualified sale?" They actually they actually prefer um, auction sales. But they they think it's the most purest form of, of sale. Mm -hmm. But they said the important part is you got to dig into it to find out who was all at the auction. Was there you know several bidders or two bidders or so you really got to dig into those sometimes. And like I said, we spend a lot of time verifying egg sales and. You really got to dig deep sometime, call buyer, seller, you know, you got to do some good verification to get good data, so. Some of those appraisers go to the, all the auctions too. They do. Yeah. And, and just, just to see who's there and who's who's bidding and, and what it's going for there and that's there to bid, they're just there to, to watch. So, I mean, that, that definitely helps. It gives, gives mm -hmm. us more information too. Right. So. Right. And uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, the Department of Revenue has also put into place a three-part test uh, in determining whether or not these sales meet the or rise the level of a qualified sale and uh, you know one of them is you know was it properly exposed was it advertised uh, um, you know uh, does it meet the test of market value and uh, there are certain criteria that are, are screened and filtered as we go through the verification process so not only is it the team at Stearns County level but it's the team at the Department of Revenues level that makes that call whether those sales stay in or not and if it's atypical and it doesn't seem to fit the pattern of other sales, uh, chances are those sales may not be included in the sales ratio study. However, they are given consideration, you know, at a later time when it comes to, uh, you know, discussing the overall assessment level that's been reached. Randy? Uh, just to remind the board, is 
the 2020 assessment is the information we'll use to calculate the payable 2021 taxes. So that's why it's important and timely and something we'll consider when we look at the budget. So. Right. Um, at this point, uh, we'll be submitting a prison file to the Department of Revenue later this month, and then uh, we should be getting the final assessment sales ratios, uh, the projections of where the overall level of assessment lands. And uh, once that information is available, that will be communicated in the annual report that will be offered later. Any other questions that we have board members? Are you all right, Jeff? Yes, I'm fine. In fact, I told <laughs> Well, geez, I mean, this is the least amount of talking. Jeez, that's pretty amazing. Well, it was difficult, but it's their show. <laughs> we'll see them later. Oh, well, I'm glad things are going well. I'm greatly relieved, in fact. All right, well, thank you, gang. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. Fun you. Very informative. Okay. Mike, uh... What do you got? Uh, the next agenda item is uh, this uh, guidelines for requests for proclamations and resolutions. And um, as, as I think you know, from time to time, either I on your behalf or you individually or as a board get requests to adopt resolutions or proclamations that don't necessarily pertain directly um, or maybe way off um, from um, from the board to actual responsibilities and duties and, and in your purview. And uh, for me, it just didn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for me that the board get pulled into those controversial um, or policy discussions in areas that you have no real authority. And, um, and that, of course, we're a nonpartisan body. And I also don't think that we should be giving the public the impression that the county board's action can uh, can impact areas of, for example, federal and, and state policy when, when, when that area isn't under your purview. And we've had a few of these types of requests lately. And, um, and it, at times I've answered without even the board knowing how I, that I did this. But, um, um, and so I, I proposed this uh, little guideline or policy an attempt to be helpful to the board <laughs> that that spells out um, for for staff so we could answer those and uh, answer when we get a request and for the public so they can understand kind of what we use uh, resolutions and proclamations for and so this this says you know we do do some things for public awareness and celebrations and special honors but when it's but when we get requested to, uh, to adopt something that really doesn't pertain uh, to to our um, our lane, if we can say that, or uh, areas that the county board really has responsibility for, um, then it says that we that we would not we would not entertain those and and not adopt them. And again, it's really just a an attempt to help the board um, stick with stick with its um, authorities, stick with its duties, and not let the public think that 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 the board has um, some responsibility over the many things that you might get requested to take action on. So that's the, the short, short end of uh, what I've proposed here. And um, again, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking it would be helpful for the board and for the public as well. Okay, questions, clarifications, uh, you know, uh, Joe? Um, just in, with regard to resolutions, um, in my work with city government too, um, you know, a, a resolution is authorizing a, a special action to take action. And we don't really, we passed resolutions, we did a number of them, I think, today. Um, and so I guess I would maybe just add, how about authorizing support or action related to county issues? Uh, whether it's a special purchase, whether it's applying for a grant, whether it's allowing people to have a parade or do some road construction, we do those things too. So and that, um, if, if we, could we add that? I mean, that's Commissioner Brisk, I, I think we could. I mean, the, the attempt here was to sort of, Call this the ceremonial proclamations and resolutions, so that so that they aren't they aren't really action. I guess is what I was trying to. But we could clarify that within this within this okay. that what you've just said that of course resolutions are are used when the county board is taking action on some particular item. Right, but it relates yeah. to the county. Yes. Right, and not to federal or state issues. Yeah, you're actually required to take you know in many in many times you're required to take action by resolution. Correct. So, yeah. 
Steve? Do we, you know, another maybe one point of clarification is when you talk about, you know, matters generally identified, you know, supporting one part. If, if we have an AMC, you know, don't sometimes we um, advocate for certain AMC policy issues, resolutions, you know, would this kind of contradict that for where we don't? Commissioner, I think from there are times when it appears that our position might be the AMC position or our position may be favored by one political party or the other, I guess. Um, but in those instances, we're taking action or expressing an opinion on something that is directly <coughs> impacting the county. So that's the, the nuance here, and I guess that could also be clarified within this policy if you felt it needed to be. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I, I'm looking at the first bullet point there. It says proclamations and resolutions will not be issued for matters of political or ideal, ideological controversy. And I think I'd, for me to support this, I'd have to have something added on there that would say, except for those that are provided for in the U.S. Constitution. Because to me, this is this has all of a sudden come up because of the current Second Amendment situation that's going on at the state level and. And it seems to me that, that this is a direct assault on the Second Amendment, the way it's currently stated. Sure. Well, and, and, and Jeff, it, with respect to that, um, and I, we heard the topic of unconstitutional law brought up before. Is that even possible? Yeah, if it's unconstitutional, right. how to become a law. Yeah. Is that your point? That's my point. Ooh, we, we have the county attorney here. I understand you. Yeah. Well, of course, you should see what I need <laughs> on your head. <laughs> the Constitution has been interpreted many times through the years right. in many different ways. Right, and is, so, so then it actually comes down to the courts making that decision. So we shouldn't really have anything that's unconstitutional law. And so, Jeff, by that, by that point, we, we shouldn't be able to, to, do, to do that. We couldn't write something that's unconstitutional. It would be able to be tried in the laws or in the courts. Then we're... Why are all of these current sanctuary things going on now that are you know, not supporting laws? You know, so I, 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 I think we, okay, I would totally say then we just let this go and not do anything and take each thing as it comes at its own. Well, and Mr. Chair, isn't the point to not there's just a myriad of things. I know in the last three months, I've had at least eight different ones that could come in front of us, and I've told them that they're outside our lane. They don't rely. They don't directly relate to um, um, the business that's in front of us. They're just taking a position. We're not a. We're not a political organization. We're not an advocacy organization. And, and actually on both sides of, of some of the measures that are in front of the legislature, and it's like th that it relate to that particular amendment, but there's a number of other ones too. So, you know, having also worked in a very political environment, there's a lot of times where people just try to get you to take pledges as individuals or sign off on things. And I think one of the things I really like about this, it's pretty clear that we're staying in our lane, we're focused in a, a, a pretty steady, thoughtful way. We don't actually have any kind of a procedure about how we'd even address any of those things. Like, what what way would we work it through? Would we work it through the sheriff's office, the county attorney's office? Would we have policy groups? Even with some of what the legislature is looking at right now, there's all kinds of questions that we don't have. I don't even know what the the language is. And I think people bring up some really people can get very passionate and understandably hope that we'd be another group that would take a position, but it won't have any impact on the law. And I, at least for myself, I've been really recommending that people contact their legislators if they have a question about some, how something would be um, put into um, uh, practice there's others that are not us that would be doing that and try to recommend that they talk about that because these are really important issues, including you know all of the Constitution. We take an oath for both the United States Constitution and the Minnesota Constitution, and we should never be doing anything that's outside of 
what is permitted by the Constitution, but there's lots of things that are permitted by the Constitution that are really have nothing to do with our county business. So I, I have to admit, I thought this was a very thoughtful way of putting it together, and we've got enough controversial issues within our own lanes, albeit how we're caring for people or providing services, wetlands, uh, a few other things that <laughs> are coming up. <laughs> so. Well, this was put out here at pretty short notice, and we're supposed to take a position on it. I think at the very least we should postpone this and, and get some public input or even probably have the public hearing on it if we're going to adopt something like this. Anybody else? Any comments? Well, Steve? just one thing I was going to say, you know, this, this doesn't, nothing, none of this would preclude anybody from coming to a public access forum or... Right. Or, you know, or, or speaking, you know, their opinions to any of us or administration, you know, it, or, you know, any departments. So, and I don't know, you know, is it, is it too simplified? Is it not, I mean, it's a guideline, I guess, to be used. I, you know, depending on what comes up, we can always, you know, still discuss it. But I, I feel we have a public access forum, so we're still allowing residents to speak you know, their opinions. And, uh, you know, I can, if, if Jeff thinks, you know, if, if you want to delay looking at it till next meeting, I, or if you feel you want some more input, I don't know if we need to do a public hearing, but. Anybody else? Well, uh, in order, we would take a motion of the board to adopt this as a policy, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Well, you feel, Terrell, you feel strongly enough on this? I'll, to I'll, make, a, I'll make a motion. Okay. I also don't have a problem if we wait another meeting yeah. to, to, to do anything with it, but I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to. Okay. Do we have a second? Do we have a second on this motion? I'll second it just so we can have more discussion before we take a vote. Okay. And I, I would have no other... Which I, means Joe wants we, to talk some more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, Jeff didn't use up his time, so yeah. Joe's going to use it. Okay. Uh, uh, and and Martin, I, have, I have no trouble with waiting, though, either. Um, and that's why I didn't want to just force the vote, people not knowing. We, we could very well wait. But but again, it, it goes back to me. We have, and, and Terrell articulated it, I think, fairly well, is that we, we have an obligation. We took an oath to... Uh, to support both the Minnesota and the um, federal constitution. And so uh, we could never pass or would do anything that would be contrary to those things. Um, and this is just a, a, a policy about how we're, we're going to approach things that come to us. And so, uh, you know, I would be okay with doing it today, or if you folks want to wait, I'm fine with that either. So we could have a little consensus here, or we could take a vote, which means I don't know which way we're gonna go. To uh if I did anything in my tenure here that I'm proud of, it seemingly would be insignificant, but I think it's a big deal. In our oath of office, after 10 years of trying, uh, I got the uh, board to accept the following addition to our oath of office at the very end to simply add to the best of our knowledge. Mm -hmm. And, ye, you know, you folks are, uh, would, uh, I, I, I think we're, we all have our own perception. Honest, I'm trying to be nice and I'm failing. Uh, the, uh, we all have our own perception of what's constitutional and what isn't. And, uh, uh, bottom line is um, the finest legal minds in the land can't agree on that. So uh, we don't rank among them in any way or shape or form. But nevertheless, uh, to the best of our knowledge, is as good as you're going to do. So uh, anyway, uh, do you, got, you folks have anything else to add? Otherwise, we'll take a vote on this and... Uh, 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 we'll move on. We've got a, uh, a pretty full uh, agenda the rest of the day. Well, Jeff, uh, 
Well, folks, do you want to take comments of the public, or should we? I can I can uh, uh, inform the gentleman that every meeting we have an open forum, a citizens forum, at the beginning of the meeting, and uh, we had people appear today that talk that address this issue. Uh, if you want to come to a subsequent meeting and address us personally, but there's nothing to prohibit you in the meantime to submit written comments to the board. So uh, there'd be two opportunities there. It isn't. It just isn't right now. So uh, if you can live with that, uh, uh, we'll take the vote and move on to the rest of what our day has to bring for us. I, I would again say we should postpone this based on it's a, such short notice. I don't well, think many of the public even know well, this is out there. Uh, let's see. We got a motion on the table uh, to vote on, uh, depending upon the success or failure of that, uh, subsequently you could make another motion. Okay. okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. 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 All right. Motion failed. So we'll be taking it up in the future. What? Can we get some something in the media or, or somewhere so that the public is aware of this and, and they can make comments? Oh, it's in the minutes. Yeah. It's on it's, TV. It's, yeah, it's yeah. on, you know, I mean, you can bet media paid attention. Okay, and let me... Let me just clarify something. We're not taking side on any particular issue. It's a matter of policy. Policy. It's a yeah. matter, it's of a matter of policy. whether we want this particular policy or not. Correct. And, and, and Jeff, just so you understand that when we have federal issues or state issues of which people vary in topic, you, they could bring resolutions to us on either side of those. Mm -hmm. and, Correct. And ask us to support those, okay? Correct. But isn't that out of our lane? We could support. We can take each thing on its own merit. But 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 again, what we would have uh, residents within our uh, jurisdiction that would be on both sides of the topic, pertaining to a topic that's not related to county government. They are, in a sense, because they filter on down here. Any rules that are made. Well, I I just it, my understanding is that federal government supersedes state government, and state mm -hmm. government supersedes uh, mm -hmm. county government. Agreed. Okay. All right. One crisis at a time. All uh, right. Uh, a motion to adjourn would be appropriate. We won't figure this it's out today, talk, yeah. and we got plenty to do. Right. Well, Mr. Chair, I guess I, instead of just having it indefinitely, I, I would make a motion that we bring it back at the next meeting to allow maybe Mike Get some, we get Mike some comments, he makes a little more clarification to it. And I, I would rather still address it versus having hanging chat out there or something. But Well, you can uh, make a motion, and if you get support, we, you'll get that, and if you don't, you don't. So make a motion, Steve. I did. Okay. All right. Uh, is there a second? I'll second with uh, an, uh, a, ch a slight uh, amendment. Could we change it not to the next meeting, but okay. uh, As... I'd say within the next few meetings or you know, okay. if we have any more information that can be brought to us. But How about this? The end okay. of the legislative session. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. I'll second that. Oops, so would scary. we then be agreeing that we're not taking up controversial things during the yeah. legislative session? Let's face it, that's what this is really all about, is trying to impact the legislature. I mean, not just this one. There's, again, people on a variety of issues that are hoping we will take a position on yep. something yeah. that may help them in their quest. Uh, I mean, the, I think the, the one that was brought up earlier today, there's one body that did something, there's one body that didn't do something. That means there probably won't be anything happening. But, mm -hmm. but again, to me, part of the good thing, I, I would be a little concerned about waiting until after session is I think we're going to start seeing a whole lot more of these and a variety, based on the ones that I had heard, they're going to get that we're ta it's, it's, it's time to come to Stearns County about things. So. The only thing is I, I think it might also... Uh, create an opportunity to vet 
more of the language. Oh, I'm all to. for us mod looking, but I don't know that we need to wait until the middle of May. I mean, I think if we if we do it within the next few meetings, it probably is enough time. Well, county government's simple to understand. If you can count to three, you got to uh, All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We counted to three. Uh, and uh, motion to adjourn then. Issues. All right. And a second. Quickly. Oh, wait. Uh, issues. Issues. Oh, issues. We got issues yet? Yep. Uh, everybody's still got, got issues. issues. Some has more than others. Yeah. Yeah. I got to figure out. I quit picking my nose, but I'll yeah. take that up on my own. Uh, any issues? Uh, we have uh, Highway 23 on Friday. Uh, Joe, okay. I think you're going. I am going. Are you no. going, Jeff? I will be in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, okay. watching St. Cloud State, hopefully, defend their yeah, national yeah, wrestling title. Okay, yeah. then I'll maybe and, come and down. And get a good look on and 23 so, on your way yes, down. Yes, I'll, I'll <laughs> take a look <laughs> at 23 <laughs> all the way down. It'll be on it a lot. Yeah. A road inspection. For, yeah. Yeah. for those that are interested, it's only about a three and a half hour drive, so it's Friday and Saturday. It's a neat town, too. Mm -hmm. Sioux Falls is pretty cool. It is. It's cool. Uh, now can we? So, Commissioner Lensmeyer, if you're looking for advice, I'm going to be offline Friday and Saturday. You are? Yeah. Oh, Just okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take it up with my therapist. Okay. So two quick things. One I was supposed to remind you about is that um, we're looking for election judges. So if somebody's interested, um, they should. We need about 50 more for this fall. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, I think a number, I think we all got this, there is also on Friday, uh, uh, Senator Senjum is coming up from Rochester with Mayor Kleiss um, and some others. They're, they're going to be touring the Wastewater uh, Treatment Center, um, which actually does relate also to some potential future opportunities for tri county solid waste management. But the, they're open to the public. There's three different uh, uh, opportunities for people to sign up for. Just, to, just one, one last thing, too. Uh, for me, anyway, the, the ad hoc airport commission is going to meet on the 23rd of this month so that's the group that brought that brought you the recommendations about the airport authority and the, their task is to try to assemble some recommendations for who that new airport authority commission will be and so if there are ideas about who the board might want to appoint as its representatives the time to be talking about those and submitting those would be now before that meeting you have one yeah. I thought, have one. That was yes. a, thought that was an interesting way of doing it instead of us being able to kind of really figure out who we, who well, we think I, I don't think that um, I don't think that well this this committee isn't going to make any any final appointments of course the board's going to want to do that right I think the thought was that they want to end up with a well-rounded board and somehow somebody needs to help the, the, the three county boards and the city council come to that and this would be at least a less cumbersome way to do it than try to sure well maybe it's get a four way elected bodies for everybody together. to agree to go back to their respective county boards if they're looking at raising um, any uh, levies <laughs> I, I guess I would I would be concerned as far as a well-rounded board I mean if you're looking at having a diverse board uh, obviously we want people on that board that's going to represent Stearns County uh, and, and so we want to make sure that you know they have our best interest in, in, in mind as far as what what's happening there so I guess I'd like you know to see obviously the most competent people we can come up with on that board but and, and the board can do whatever procedure it would like to, to, yeah. to make that appointment I mean you could you can interview these people if you if you wanted to do go that far with it I mean okay so we just need to we need to work our way through that somehow, and the ad hoc committee is going to begin to talk about that. Okay. And not that I, I don't have anybody in mind. I'm just going to make sure that we got the right people there. Has the makeup been decided as to how many from each county? Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah there's two from each county. Okay. Two from each entity, so there would be eight, and then there's one that the four groups need to uh, agree upon. Okay. And I just had one last a question, too, before we adjourn. Any... Anything on Electrolux? Has anything been done or any movement? Have we heard from those folks at all? Did, does anybody knowledge? You know, here it's a, there's yep, a I'm on the uh, uh, Career Solutions uh, board. Uh, a lot's been done. 
Uh, would you like a report from Tammy Berry, the executive director, to future meeting? It, it, we could do it in a meeting or just do it in a memo. It, it, but I, I'm just, you know, I get questions, you know. Pick Carol your and poison, I DC and, pick your poison yeah. Joe. What the do you city, want? The city of St. Cloud, uh, right. you know, received a federal grant and they hired an employee to help with that transition um, in addition to other things. But uh, and maybe, a, maybe a report from, from that Per, right. from the St. Cloud EDA might be helpful too. That would be helpful in part uh, because uh, Congressman Emmer and others brought up asking about, not certainly concerned about the former employees, but also about the site itself. Okay. okay. Anything else? I think the horse is dead. It is. Okay. <laughs> I'll move to adjourn. And a second. So moved. Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, we done.